So next thing, uh, point number two, is do some recon beforehand. So, and this is the first of a bunch of stupid pictures I put in here. Um, the, uh, this, is just a, this is a scale for all business development, networking in general. This isn't just for pitching. But um, if, if, you're, if you're meeting somebody, um, let's say you have a half an hour meeting with some venture person or something, um, you can get a really far, a lot further in the conversation just by doing some five minutes of research beforehand. I mean, LinkedIn is really good for this, right? But just, you're attempting to establish common ground with people. You're going to have much better conversations if people feel like you have something that they can relate to you about. So, I mean, this is, this is, super, this is super common stuff. I'm sure you guys know. But, like, if you have someone that you worked together with in the past, you went to the same college, like, worked at the same company, just have something to say from the point early in the meeting. Um, you are essentially establishing common ground with someone, and that'll just help you in the rest of your conversation. Um, keeping in mind that venture people just speak to hundreds of entrepreneurs a month, um, and very often, like, it all blends together, and they have maybe not a great, um, uh, a great recollection for who's who. So anything you can do that just says, oh, like, we both went to Cal Poly or something, like, go Mustangs, rah, rah. I mean, that's, that's helpful stuff. Um, especially because, I mean, if you, if you do any reading on just how people make decisions, you read, like, thinking fast and slow, like, or any of the Malcolm Gladwell stuff. People like to think that they're logical, and investors like to think that they're super calculated and make, you know, these money ball decision makings. But at the end of the day, um, you generally are making emotional decisions, like you're betting on entrepreneurs that you like um, personally and you have things in common with. So if you're going to meet with someone, go on LinkedIn, spend three minutes just seeing if there's any good talking points you can get, you get uh, the conversation rolling with. That's really helpful. Same with opening emails, right? You know, we both went to Cal, you know, that's awesome. Good start. Um, okay, so third one is um, I prepared a list of, of questions that you should essentially have the answers to going into any sort of early meeting with a venture capital person. Um, this is a long list, so I'm not going to read all them individually. Um, if you guys are able to get the slides or check out the blog post afterwards, I think that this is the best part of the blog post is um, these list, I think it's about 15 or 20 questions that you guys should have the answers prepared to going into the, uh, going into your meeting. Um, there on the next slide, blah, blah, blah. Um, you, you may, I, I, I'm going to put them on the, on the screen. I want you guys to read them and let me know if any of them seem like weird or, or crazy or hard to understand. Um, if, uh, in my opinion, they're all fair game for, for a first meeting. Um, not all entrepreneurs or VCs will agree with that. Maybe they'll think, like, this is too soon to be talking about this. But I think the important thing is knowing the answers to these questions off the top of your head. Um, if you're the CEO of, of your business and you're starting, some, you're starting a new company, um, it's a really bad sign if you don't know, for example, what your ARR is um, or what it costs to acquire a new customer. Like, if you say something like, oh, you know, I got to call my C CFO, I got to go dig that up, um, that's not a great answer. It's much better to say, I'm not comfortable talking about that in the first meeting than to say I don't know the answer to that question. Because if it's like you're the CEO of your company, how could you possibly not know what your customer acquisition costs are? Like that would be um, the fastest way to get venture people to pretty much immediately lose confidence in you. So um, this is a list. Can you guys spend like 20 seconds reading this? Let me know if any of these sound hard to understand or crazy. You have a question? Yeah, that's a great point. So some of these, some of these won't apply. So I'm not saying that you need to know these like um, unilaterally even before you have customers. Like that would be a crazy thing. But um, it just putting them in context, right? Like customer acquisition costs prior to the prior to you actually having customers and knowing what your marketing expenses are. That's something that you should reasonably know. Um, if you're pre-revenue, uh, pre-product, then still like um, you know you should be able to know off the top of your head like how many employees do you have? Like why is your product amazing? Um, Tell me the details of your technology, even if you're not the CTO and someone else um, is managing that part. Like these are all within the purview of the CEO and things you should be able to rattle off. Um, but yeah, great point. If you have, if you're pre-revenue, you wouldn't know the answer to that question. Um, jumping back like two slides, what do you think about pitching without a deck? Two. Maybe it was three, but whatever. Just bridge deck stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What about pitching just without a deck? Depends on the context, right? So if you have a two if you have a two minute presentation, you may not need a deck at all. You're just on stage at some accelerator event or just you know one on one. Um, then that that may maybe a situation where you don't want to do that. Um, 
or where you'd want to go without a deck. Um, even the first meeting, you don't necessarily need a deck, I would say. In our first early phone screens, maybe, um, I'll put, these, put the questions back up, um, maybe 30% of the time there's no deck and we're just talking off the cuff. Again, if you know the answers to, these, to the questions about your business and you're able to communicate it without other materials, then that actually speaks highly of you as an entrepreneur that you can just talk about it off the cuff. Um, if you're doing a, for a formal presentation to partners um, at a venture fund, for example, then you would have a deck. Like that would just be part of the process. But in the early discussions, I think it's, it, it's a reasonable thing to do. Venture people will ask you for decks. Um, the reason is because the deck is the easiest way for us to communicate what you do to other people in the fund. And you want to make it easy for us to be like, hey, like partners, you know, check out, check out this company. Here's the information on them. Um, so that's really what it's for, and less about, less about the in-person presentation. Um, but yeah, for early meetings, you may, not, you may not need it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so if like a venture fund asked for your deck and you said, I don't use one, is that kind of outlandish? <laughs> I don't know if outlandish is the word, but it would be kind of unorthodox. I mean, the deck, I mean, it's, it's marketing for you, right? It allows, if you're talking to me, the associate, right? Um, it, the deck empowers me to market you to the rest of my firm. So if, if you're not giving me the tools to do that, then you're disadvantaging yourself. Gotcha. Um, with the phone screening where it's more just kind of like talking and everything, as the, the entrepreneur, how should you feel with I mean, I'm not the best person to answer that because I'm not the entrepreneur on the other line. Um, but I think, I think you can ask, mostly. I mean, if you're talking to a reasonable person who's down to earth, person you're communicating with, um, I think you can just say, like, did this, did this go well? Does this feel like something you could plausibly invest in? Um, the, the person you're talking to might not know that until they talk to other people in the fund. Um, sometimes I'll get opportunities to come my way and, like, I don't know the market that well they're selling into, but other people in the fund totally get it. So I might think it's great, and then I pass it on to a partner, and they're like, we would never do this because of reasons X, Y, Z. It can go both, it can go both ways. Um, so I think you can totally feel comfortable asking for early feedback just about how did it go. Um, but what you get in that feedback may change once the fund has had time to digest it. Okay, so it's never going to be like someone, or not never, but usually not like the associate is going to be completely like, yeah, I'll Now, yeah, the best thing that you could hear is the associate saying, like, I get it. I think it's interesting. Um, I can't verify that it's a market that we would necessarily invest in, but I'm pumped enough to take it to the team. That's the best case scenario. Um, you'd be more, more likely you would get a hard no initially than a hard yes that's actually real is what you should expect. So out of all these questions, which one do people trip up most on and why? Talking to you. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, a lot of people. So I'll answer that two ways. One thing they don't. Some, a lot of people don't want to talk about is how much cash they have left. A lot of people get defensive about that question. Um, I think that's. Um, I understand why you'd be defensive about it because that's like confidential company information. But if you're asking someone like, I want you to invest into my company. My company is a business entity. Um, and so it's like if you're investing in a public stock, you're buying like Apple or something, it's uh, an important line item is the cash in the bank, right? So that is of material importance to investors. So I would say trip up in, in the sense that they get defensive about it and it sends bad signals to investors is the cash one. Um, just trip up in general, like not know the answer to is probably this one, which is what are you gonna do with this money? Because um, a lot of people are just like, oh, it just seems like a good opportunity to raise. We could use $750,000. And then we say, oh, what are you gonna use it for? And they're like, well, um, Bring the product to market, you know, marketing, right? And we're like, you got to be more, get a more specific plans than that one. More questions? I guess one more point on that. Um, yeah. Mind, what, what would be the, your ideal answering of that question? For the, for the funds one? Um, it just, I mean, you don't need to be super hyper specific, but something along the lines of, okay, like we want 750K, um, we've got 300K earmarked to hiring these two salespeople. Um, we want to hire a support person that's going to cost this much. Um, we got to do a patent filing that's going to be seven, it's going to be 75,000 or something. That adds up to like 550K. We want to have 200,000 buffer dollars on top of that just to be safe. So 750 sounds good. Um, and then kind of right size that for 
what the valuation will likely be. So you say, oh, you know, that seems appropriate this period of time because we think our company's worth $2 million or something. Um, just, you don't need to be super precise because, and this goes for pretty much anything, like not just this question, but just general sort of uh, thing to think about. Like being overly precise is not something you want to do because you're just, you're talking about the future, right? Like startups are uncertain in general, like having super precise, precise projections or being feeling really certain about the future is kind of a bad strategy because the future never turns out the way you want it to be. But what you want to show is the appropriate amount of just thoughtfulness. Like, we don't know how the future is going to be, but this is our plan. We've given it um, a significant but not insane amount of thought. Um, does that kind of make sense? And, and then real quick on that topic, too. Like for, I know a lot of us have been talking about uh, paying ourselves or uh, what you pay co-founders for living expenses and such like that with investment money. Uh, like if you could just like, explain real quick like what that looks like for a VC when someone says that they're using some of the funds to pay themselves. Well, as, yeah, so as long as it's like, I, I mean, I, you wouldn't, if you were raising like fifty, like $20,000, like friends and family, like that probably wouldn't be, but if you're talking about like a seed fund, something like that, um, raise some money, yeah, like that's, that's part of what the money's for, is to pay you. Um, if you're like starving and or, you know, worried about rent, you're not going to be an effective entrepreneur. So it, it, I think a lot of... Like, I'm on Quora a lot, and a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs ask that question. They're really nervous about bringing it up with venture people, but that's part of what the money is for. So you shouldn't feel weird about having that conversation. Um, you also shouldn't expect you're going to pay yourself 200 k right off the bat. But just the, the notion of, hey, it's going to be enough to cover my living expenses um, so that I can focus on this opportunity and devote my full attention to it um, is an appropriate use of seed or A round or et cetera money. I mean, it varies on where you live. Obviously, it's more expensive to live here than if you were in Omaha or something. And it also matters, like, are you an older entrepreneur with kids? Um, uh, you know, money for college, that sort of thing. Like, where uh, it'll make a material difference. Um, I think for people, you guys are in, like your mid twenties, early to mid twenties. Nineteen. Nineteen. Some of you are younger, but I mean, if you if you lived out here, like, I think. You want me to pick a number, like 50,000 is like, I think what a lot of people start paying themselves and then when they get a little further on, more than that, but like it, it varies. I mean, I think you don't want to, um, have any read the, read the Peter Thiel book, Zero to One? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he says that uh, there's an inverse correlation between founder salaries and the, the likelihood the company will succeed. So if you own the, if you, um, you know, you own the company, right, and you are invested in the company's success, every especially early, every additional dollar you pay yourself is increased cash burn on the company. So it's a, a decreased likelihood that your company will survive. So um, anyone who opts to take more cash initially is basically betting against their company. Um, so you kind of want to do the lowest you can get away with. If you live in San Francisco and rent is high, like that might be 50, 60, 70 K or something. Um, but if you really believe in your company and you're going to make it work and like you're you know, you're going to crash in your friend's couch or something for a year and, and live on ramen. I mean, we're not going to encourage you to do that, but that's also betting on your business, right? So there's sort of this calculus that goes on. I mean, anything under six figures, like, would not make me think anyone is being selfish or anything. <laughs>